Welcome to the Risk Management Chapter 4 Lecture. I'm Dr. Bill Perkins and today we're going to cover risk assessment. The material for this lecture was taken from the textbook Business Continuity and Risk Management Essentials of Organizational Resilience by Kurt Engelman and Douglas Henderson. So we're going to get started. So these are the chapter four objectives. We're going to define risk terminology. We're going to define the purpose of risk assessment. We're going to review the RA risk assessment process. We're going to review how threats to an organization are identified. And we're going to identify and evaluate controls. We're going to explore event probability estimation and we're going to identify methods of impact estimation. We're going to analyze risk measurement and identify the risks of greatest concern and examine the options to manage risks. So risk management is the basis of business continuity management and it provides an analytical foundation for decision making regarding the treatment of risk. So the key principle behind risk management is that risk cannot be eliminated but then it can be controlled. The appropriate control to employ depends on both the likelihood of the risk occurring and the magnitude of the loss if the risk does occur. Now often risk can be quantified however when risk cannot be quantified either because the underlying information does not exist or because it is too expensive to collect principles of risk management can still be applied. Now these principles can be seen on this uh, slide and include uh, first identifying what can go wrong by analyzing the underlying threats and possible crisis events. Uh, next you have identifying what controls are currently in place. Uh, next we have evaluating the current exposure to the organization. And we have identifying new controls that can be implemented to reduce this exposure. Now evaluating whether these controls should be in, implemented by investigating costs and benefits is the last one. Now an event or incident um, is an occurrence that could have an impact upon the organization. So because business continuity management deals with events that are improbable, analyzing the risks is very challenging. So it can be difficult to come to grips with uncertainty surrounding highly unlikely events with major potential adverse impact upon the operation of an organization. Now think about uh, prior to the beginning of 2020, I'm sure you had a lot of organizations who thought uh, shutting down um, due to a, uh, a worldwide pandemic would have been pretty far-fetched. So that's why that's why a lot of organizations as, as well don't engage in that type of risk management. They kind of shrug their shoulders thinking, you know, um, what are the chances that could happen? So the core of the analysis involves uh, specifying a set of encompassing crisis e events, um, which is, you know, which represent what can go wrong. And a threat or hazard is a source of potential negative impact. And a crisis or a crisis event is a manifestation of a threat. So if not handled properly, a crisis may have severe negative impact. And a minor crisis has limited impact and does not affect the overall functioning uh, capacity of the organization. On the other hand, a major crisis has the potential to seriously disrupt the overall operation of the organization. And a disruption is an interruption. 
of operations. A disaster is a major crisis event which imperils an organization. Um, an event may be deemed a disaster due to the factors such as loss of life, environmental damage, uh, asset damage, and duration of disruption. And a catastrophe is an extreme disaster. Risk is the possibility of experiencing an event measured in terms of probability and impact. And probability is a measure of the likelihood of an event. A risk event chain describes the transition from threat to crisis to disruption to impact. And figure point four point one here, taken directly from your textbook, depicts a risk event chain. Now, as an example, fire is a threat, and a crisis would be a fire affecting a particular facility. The fire can cause a disruption of the processing facility for a lengthy period of time, and a disruption can result in an impact of asset damage and revenue loss. Now, the paradigm of the risk event chain provides flexibility in the level of detail to use in analyzing risk. So, for example, using a broad view during an initial study, an impact can be thought of as resulting from a threat without explicitly studying the transitions through a crisis disruption. And controls can reduce the probability of transitioning through the risk event chain and can mitigate the resultant impact. It is possible for different crisis events to result in the same disruption. For example, a data center could be destroyed by a fire, flood, or explosion. So because um, identifying all possible crisis events is difficult and impractical, the events chosen for analysis should represent the most significant exposures faced by the organization. And risk analysis is the process of identifying events, determining causes, and estimating probabilities and impact. Risk evaluation is the process of comparing risk levels with established risk criteria. And risk assessment is the process of risk analysis and risk evaluation. So the purpose of risk assessment is to prioritize planning by assessing the likelihood of events and their potential impact on critical functions functions. Risk assessment is fundamental to identifying vulnerability and is the basis for resource allocation and exposure mitigation. Vulnerability is a measure of exposure to a threat that increases the probability and impact of the event increases. So again, vulnerability is a measure of exposure to a threat that increases as the probability and impact of the event increases.
And risk tolerance is the amount of risk that an organization is prepared to accept. Risk tolerance drives the level of action an organization will take to control identified threats. Risk management is comprised of the process of risk assessment, risk communication, and risk treatment. Risk communication is the exchange of information among stakeholders, and risk treatment is the selection of procedures for managing risk. And risk assessment is used to determine the most significant threats to an organization and to direct hazard specific planning to address these threats by prioritization. And risk assessment activities should be focused on the most urgent business functions identified during the business impact analysis. Taking you back to last chapter. And these are the steps involved in administering a risk assessment. Identify significant threats to critical operations. Identify and evaluate controls, estimate event probabilities, estimate impacts, determine a risk measure combining impact and probability, and prioritize risks. Now, senior management reviews the findings of the risk assessment and findings, um, you know, provide a basis for managing the risk. So the senior management is going to review your findings here in this risk assessment. Now threats are pervasive and represent possible sources of negative impact to an organization. Threats can be natural, accidental, or man-made and can lead to disruptions in operations which can adversely impact an organization. Significant threats that warrant further consideration are identified during risk assessment. Now, the following slides uh, contain some generic threats to consider. You know, we have acts of war, armed attack, blackmail, um, blizzard, chemical spill, contamination, earthquake fire and we're going to continue with this list and flood freeze hostage situation hurricane insurrection kidnapping power outage product defect and finalizing our list there are we have radiation leak riot uh, terrorism tornado transportation disruption tsunami uh, volcano eruption and workplace violence. Now there are other categories of threats that can have a negative impact on the organization. A holistic approach towards risk management needs to include an analysis of all threats such as those of financial, economic, market, fraudulent and negligence of, in origin. Now the relevance of a threat depends upon many factors including geographic location, infrastructure, political conditions and economic conditions. A systematic way to collect and analyze threat data is begin with a broad view and continue to a detailed view. Now for example, using a sequence such as region, uh, community and building may be useful. Um, see how that breaks down. You start off with the region, break it down to the community, and down to the building. 
Uh, threats can be identified in the general region, such as hurricane, or in the community, uh, such as a power outage, and in the building, such as a fire. For natural threats, the gathering of data will uh, sufficiently detail and uh, with sufficient detail and accuracy can usually be accomplished by research on the internet. Uh, general information for weather and seismic uh, threats is usually easily obtained just by uh, your, you know, your very um, easy and easy approach to just you know, put it in a Google search and see what comes up. So when evaluating man-made uh, accidental and or non-natural threats, there are often a large number of variables involved. So um, information for man-made accidental or other threats tend to be less location specific and more judgment is often required. And the manifestation of a threat as a crisis may lead to a disruption in identifying possible disruption. It is helpful to draw upon information gathered in the business impact and analysis. And some outages that should be addressed include uh, destruction of a processing area due to a fire or bomb, destruction of a building by fire, bomb, or earthquake, flooding of a processing area or adjacent areas, due to hurricane, storm, or rupture of water pipe, inaccessibility to a building due to a fire or bomb threat, uh, outages in communication, electric power, steam supply, or air conditioning uh, due to a fire or flood, or lack of processing per personnel due to a strike, um, transportation problems, or a snowstorm. Now those specific events which may impact operations and cause disruption beyond the recovery time objective. Remember the RTO from the uh, last chapter. So part of the difficulty in assessing certain threats is a result of the type of organization under analysis. So the two business cases in the uh, textbook illustrate the differences. Uh, another part of the difficulty in assessing certain, th assessing certain threats is a result of a large number of controls, exposures, and variables. So over the next four slides, we're going to go over um, some of the examples provided in the textbook and the first example we have is an organization with a technology department that has an IT alternate site plan and backup data center that can be actively uh, activated rapidly will be able to recover quickly from a major crisis. An organization without these planning and resources available will most likely not be able to recover so quickly. Um, also, a technology department with a good physical control, such as, uh, or control mechanisms, such as uh, raised floors, fire suppression system, dedicated HVAC, uh, and backup electric generator at the data center is less likely to experience a major crisis than an organization that does not have good physical data center controls in place. In our next example, an organization with good security controls such as proper procedures, monitored security system, dedicated security personnel, it can avoid um, major security breaches. Uh, security will also be impacted by the general crime rate in the area and the exact nature of the organization.
Example 3, a manufacturing organization that requires the use of hazmat materials can reduce the likelihood of a hazardous release and can contain a release um, better if a good hazard response plan is in place. So it uh, can be much more effective. Uh, many other factors are important. Um, one man has the hazmat team been properly trained. Uh, another, are they properly equipped? And what types of chemicals are being used? You know, how are the chemicals stored? They're all factors. And the RA of a terrorist attack is most difficult to make. Um, the type, level, and location of the event will all be factors uh, that are often hard to pinpoint. Um, risk assessment must consider the likelihood of a te terrorist attack on the organization and in the immediate area. So plus RA must risk assessment um, must consider the impact, if any, of a major terrorist attack at a distant location. So certain organizations may be impacted by overseas terrorist attacks. Especially think about if you are outsourcing um, or part of your supply chain, you know, for your manufacturing operations uh, is overseas and it happens to be in a um, area that has a lot of terrorist activities. You know, so that's the type of risk you need to factor in. You know, are you going to be, instead of, um, are you going to be forced to go with another supplier um, if you're outsourcing? Or are you going to be forced to make it instead of buy it? You know, get go into those make or buy strategies that you learn in operations management. Um, so there's a lot to consider. And location has a lot to do with it. So controls are devices and procedures that prevent the occurrence of a crisis event or mitigate the impact of a threat. Controls are devices and procedures that, present, that prevent the occurrence of a crisis event or mitigate the impact of a threat. And controls include physical security, preventive maintenance, information security, and personal procedures. The effectiveness of existing controls should be evaluated. The evaluation of controls includes determining the benefits of the controls, identifying costs, developing operations, and improving the controls. And after determining any outside, outstanding risk to the organization, potential cost-effective controls are identified and recommended for management approval. Now, some controls reduce the proper probability that an event will occur. Other alternatives reduce losses by providing some business continuity during a disaster or improving workplace safety. Uh, generic control checklists are useful for exploring alternatives. For each function, the generic alternatives are further developed with appropriate details for the specific location. Now the annualized cost of each alternative is calculated and compared to the reduction in the expected annualized risk exposure. Now some decisions are obvious, others require more detailed quantifications and sensitivity analysis. Recommendations regarding additional planning, improvements to existing procedures, and physical controls to mitigate damages, um, injuries, and loss of life should be identified. Now over the next few slides we're going to discuss some of the common safety concerns such as 
building evacuation, hazardous materials, personnel issues, and security. Two of the most common safety procedures are building evacuation and shelter in place. So most individuals understand how to conduct a building evacu evacuation as these procedures have been regularly practiced in school systems, um, kind of become cultural, uh, especially if you've gone through the American uh, school system, always practicing some type of a fire drill or evacuation. However, shelter in place procedures have historically not been practiced as frequently as building evacuation procedures. So it is important that formal plans be developed to address both building evacuation and shelter in place procedures. Plans should include the identification of safe gathering areas, routes to gathering areas, and procedures to make a head count at the gathering area. You want to make sure you have 100% accountability of your personnel. Um, if you don't, you're going to have to have mechanisms in place to achieve accountability. Now, the need to communicate emergency instructions during a crisis event is central to the effectiveness of the executing the procedures, um, execution of the procedures. So, communicate accurate and sufficiently detailed information presents an important challenge. Now, typically alarms alert everyone to conduct a building evacuation. So, at a minimum, some type of siren uh, siren mechanism, some type of siren um, audible device is needed to alert everyone that a dangerous condition exists and uh, to shelter in place um, and shelter in place needs to be performed. So in addition to a siren, it is very important to utilize an intercom or other communication system. Some type of a desktop pop-up uh, works extremely well. Um, you know, emergency information regarding a hostile intruder, um, hazardous uh, release, or a tornado cannot be effectively communicated by a siren alone. So depending on a specific threat, there are important differences in the exact shelter-in-place procedures. So for a hostile intruder, you know, uh, you want to lock the doors. Um, you know, windows and window treatment should be closed and everyone should get out of sight. And for a tornado threat, uh, with time permitting, employees in outside rooms should relocate to interior corridors. Now, this procedure is not recommended during a hostile intruder situation. So, but there, when you hear a shelter in place and it's associated with an active shooter or a hostile intruder, um, you really do want to... Um, you know, kind of take cover, uh, make sure your doors are locked, and make sure the intruder can't see it, see through any windows. So you want to try to block whatever windows with uh, whatever mechanism in place, whether you have shades or you have to physically block it with, um, you know, by pushing something in front of the window. And even uh, when it comes down to uh, if you are charged in your organization with developing some type of a plan, again, you know, do your homework. Use the Internet. Um, you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You can collaborate, look for some of the best practices. Uh, a lot of this stuff is uh, published um, online through uh, various channels. You know, a lot of police departments, too, also have uh, contacts. Um, for to come out and do like site surveys and make recommendations. Now, organizations may have some level of hazardous materials or hazmat and should review the following. You know, um, first, uh, have all hazardous materials been identified? You know, is there a material safety data sheet for every hazardous material maintained by the organization? And Material Safety Data Sheet, or MDS, is a summary of information uh, regarding hazardous materials. Uh, next, are all employees trained in utilizing emergency action plans, evacuation routes, 
and alarm activation. Uh, organizations with large amounts of hazmat present in the workplace require special planning to avoid environmental contamination and health hazards. So planning should contemplate the following. Now first, has uh, the organization identified and trained a hazardous response team in compliance with federal and state hazardous materials and first responder regulations, you know, in, with plant shutdown, use of fire extinguishers, chemical spill control, search and rescue procedures, and first aid. So there's a lot that goes into this. In continuing with our assessment, um, does training occur initially upon hire or annually, um, at least annually, and whenever new equipment or materials are introduced? Yes, yeah, so your, your plan needs to be very agile um, because if you have a solid plan and then some type of a new um, tool in the workplace, some type of new uh, piece of equipment, uh, you're going to have to train it. You're going to have to change your plan and train the new equipment. Uh, have personnel have personal protection equipment or PPE, a common term we're hearing now a lot, um, such as respirators, boots, and whole body coverings for adverse environmental conditions been considered. And unless the, unless the facility is near a hospital, or other medical treatment facility, are there on-site personnel uh, properly equipped and trained in first aid? Are hazardous materials stored in approved containers? No, or properly vented areas where volatile ch uh, chemicals cannot interact or are away from heat sources? Are non-smoking policies established and enforced? Are all hazardous waste disposed of properly? And is every incident investigated? As employees are one of the critical keys to the success of any organization, employee safety and security issues are important components of business continuity management. Uh, particularly after a community-wide crisis event, the recovery of workforce is a high priority and a challenge. So after a community-wide crisis event, employees may not be able to work for a wide range of reasons. Uh, employees and their families may be in, injured or be living in a survival mode. Um, transportation to and from work may be difficult or impossible. Uh, Back-to-work policies and payroll policies will need to be developed to address all these contingencies. Uh, providing employees with some level of crisis assistance with help um, with, you know, workforce recovery. Uh, management will need to address the following. Um, after a community-wide crisis, remember employee may, employees may not be able to work. Um, we cover that. Transportation may be very difficult. We cover that. Back to work policies and payroll policies need to be developed. Um, can the business function without with a skeleton staff? Can temporary replacement workers be found and quickly trained? And is uh, cross training uh, being performed? You know, cross functional training. You don't want those. Remember when we covered uh, chapter three, we spoke about the single point failures. So you want some redundancy across the organization. Um, a labor action can shut down um, operations. So remember, for organizations with unionized labor employees, the possibility of a strike or a work slowdown or other labor action needs to be considered. And management needs to address the following. You know, is there a plan in place to deal with strikes? Can non-union employees or management employees maintain critical operations without union employees? Does the organization have a good relationship with the labor union? Does the organization have a plan to either maintain or improve labor union relations? And what has the history been of uh, work stoppages uh, due to strikes? 
and what are the key labor issues that are current in dispute and when does the labor union contract expire. These are all important things to know because each one introduces a um, certain degree of risk or your operation shutting down. Now for protection of both employees and organization assets, all organizations need some level of physical security uh, protection. So the level of protection largely depends on the environment surrounding the location of the organization and the value of physical assets. The nature of the organization's wealth as the nature of all nearby organizations will also be factors um, as certain organizations may be targets of an attack. And all organizations need to address the following and select appropriate security controls. So you have uh, businesses need some level of physical security protection. The level of protection depends on the value of assets. The nature of the business is a factor. An appropriate security system should be maintained. Security guards control access and delivery should be checked. Security measures for employees and visitors should be in place. Equipment should be, uh, should be secured and discarded documents should be shredded. Um, security procedures regarding hiring and terminating employees are crucial. Now, risk analysis can be qualitatively or quantitatively um, in terms of, well, qualitative or quantitative in terms of determining the probability of events. So, for example, if a, um, a qualitative valuation of probability may use uh, designations such as high, medium, or low, while quantitative approach would develop numer numerical probabilities. And estimating the probability of events involves reviewing historical data and discussing the events with relevant groups such as the fire department, weather bureau, utilities companies, uh, computer virus incident monitoring agencies, police departments, building engineers, reliability engineers, and government agencies, and in determining what data are necessary uh, to collect it is important to consider the risk factors including weather, topography, um, population, transportation, infrastructure, facilities, and supply chain. And data can be obtained from a variety of sources including interviews, questionnaires, workshops, documents, observation, data repositories, and internal audits. As depicted on this slide, your sources of data can be categorized as internal and external sources. So your internal includes your management staff, uh, auditing, um, your working staff, your engineering and your contractors, all people who are organic or unique uh, to the organization. Your external are your FEMA, uh, Weather Bureau, uh, emergency, management, uh, emergency managers, uh, police officials, fire officials, and utilities. And the impact of a disruption on an organization may be measured quantitatively or qualitatively and may be expressed in various units such as downtime or dollars. Time is money. Money is time. The level of impact may be based upon various criteria such as loss of life, environmental damage, asset damage, and duration of disruption.
the impact of an event may be measured in terms of downtime of a critical resource. For example, a severe winter storm may cause little damage but completely shut down all organizations in a given area one day. For organizations with time-sensitive operations such as medical facilities, customer service centers, or delivery centers, the loss of a day is very important. Now for some other organizations such as private schools or a civic uh, association, a one-day loss of operations will have little impact. So although the impact of any given crisis will be a function of the organization itself, using downtime as a measure of impact is valid prior to performing a more thorough analysis of the impact in financial terms. And disruptions in operations can result in losses, both direct and indirect. Although direct losses may be significant, they may not have a lasting impact on earnings. So direct losses include losses due to physical damage, um, expenses related to incremental personnel, and losses resulting from failure to process deliverables in time. Now, indirect losses include the loss of future business due to the disruptions. For example, customers who switched their business to their competitors, to your competitors. Um, these may be the biggest potential losses and may be the most difficult to estimate. And estimates of direct and indirect losses may be obtained from extensive interviews with operations and business managers. The expected annualized losses for an event are the sum of annualized losses for all areas affected by the event. For example, if four processing divisions are affected by a fire, the expected losses would be the sum of their individual expected losses. Uh, naturally, uh, appropriate steps must be taken to ensure common losses are not double counted. And consider the following illustration from the textbook highlighting impact categories utilizing life safety threat, um, environmental damage, asset damage, and disruption time as criteria. So for impact classification, expected and not worst case scenarios are used. Otherwise, virtually every risk would be assigned an extreme impact, making it difficult to determine which risk is actually more important. Note that the def definition of the impact level will need to be adjusted from organization to organization. For organizations that have time critical services such as an organization that relies heavily on customer service or call center operations, a serious impact may be a, the downtime of uh, only one day or less. So for college and university academic operations, a serious impact may be a week. And there are several methods of classifying risk, but most approaches use some measure of risk involving event probabilities and resultant impacts. So risk, estimate, uh, risk estimation can be quantitative or qualitative in terms of probability and impact. For different organizations, so we'll find that different measures of probability and impact will suit their needs best. For example, a very basic method would score both impact and probability as low or high, which can be represented in a two by two matrix. As illustrated in your textbook, um, risk can be prioritized as high impact and high probability, high impact and low probability, low impact and high probability, low impact and low probability. Very simple. 
Most organizations require a more detailed method of assessing impact and probability, perhaps requiring a 5x5 five five matrix or by actually calculating impact in terms of dollars and determining true probabilities. So risk measure is a quantitative uh, summary value of risk based on probability and impact. A common method is to score both probability and impact on numerical scales and use the formula illustrated on this slide, risk measure equals probability multiplied by impact. That's risk measure equals probability multiplied by impact. And uh, there are some sample problems and case studies in the back of the chapter in the textbook that you can um, take a crack at using this uh, simple formula. So this score can then be used to prioritize risk. With a dollar impact and true probability, the risk measure would be an expected value, which could be used in cost-benefit analysis. And the aforementioned uh, risk measure formula effectively evaluate a crisis of high probability and low impact, such as a thunderstorm, equivalent to a crisis of low probability and high impacts such as an earthquake or hurricane. However, this result may not be satisfactory for some organizations. So when risks are evaluated, if it is appropriate, um, consider the impact to be more important than the probability or P in the formula. The following formula may be used and that is risk measure equals probability times or multiply by impact squared or to the second power. And here it is again. So if impact is more important than the probability, consider this. So that is risk measure equals probability times or multiplied by impact square or to the second power. Whereas risk treatment involves selecting and implementing measures to modify risk, it encompasses the following four approaches. Uh, first, you have avoidance, which are activities causing the risk are eliminated. Uh, transfer which is the risk in part or in totality um, is assigned to another. Um, you have reduction, and that is the likelihood and or impact of the risk is reduced. And acceptance, and that is the risk is retained. Now, given the four approaches for risk, risk treatment, being able to completely avoid the risk appears to be the ideal solution. Unfortunately, completely avoiding risk may not be possible or even uh, possible only if extreme measures are taken. Uh, for example, if an organization is located along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, the organization is going to have some level of hurricane risk. Storm shutters can be installed, roofs reinforced, Extensive planning can be completed and many other steps can be taken to reduce the risk. Unfortunately, unless the organization is willing to move, the hurricane risk cannot be completely eliminated. And the most common type of risk uh, transfer is to pay a premium and to an insurance company to cover financial exposure. So business interruption insurance can compensate for the direct uh, cost of damage, business continuity, or recover expenses and downtime. Although lost revenue can be covered, insurance will not be able to cover uh, the indirect costs of the losing a customer 
or customer dissatisfaction. And basic questions to be addressed with an insurance professional include uh, what are the appropriate coverage limits and deductibles? What types of crisis events are covered? Does the insurance provide adequate uh, protection for senior management? Is coverage for replacement cost or actual value? Um, does business interruption insurance cover loss of income and payroll expenses? And if an effective business continuity management program is implemented, will the insurance, the insurance premiums go down? Now, it is important to note risk transfer is not limited to insurance. Many organizations located in office buildings transfer security and facility risk to building management. So payroll processing is commonly outsourced to other organizations uh, for business continuity planning purposes. It is uh, unimportant unimportant whether the uh, organization is directly responsible or the responsibility has been assigned to another party. It is important that all organization processes and infrastructure requirements are protected and alternate procedures and infrastructure resource are, resources are identified. And risk reduction can include either the introduction or enhancement of physical controls. An example of a physical control would be the installation of a sprinkler system to suppress fires. Uh, the introduction of surveillance cameras and full per, uh, perimeter alarm system is another example of physical control that reduces risk. Um, the introduction of physical controls will involve an initial expense and possibly an ongoing expense as well. Uh, risk reduction can also include either the introduction or enhancement of existing procedures. Developing and practicing formal fire evacuation plans will reduce the life safety risk associated with fires. Um, training employees to report obvious security exposures is another uh, example of a procedural control that reduces risk. Uh, unlike most physical controls, most procedural controls have a minimal cost impact However, procedural controls will typically require some level of time investment. And to the extent that a risk cannot be avoided, transferred, or reduced, the risk is accepted. As a practical matter, it is almost impossible to completely eliminate certain risks. Um, as discussed earlier, if the organization is located along the uh, coast of the Gulf of Mexico, the organization is going to have some level of hurricane risk, and unless the organization is willing to move, the hurricane risk cannot be completely eliminated. Moreover, wherever um, organizations, uh, whenever organizations relocate, there will likely be some new type of risk encountered. Um, common reasons for accepting some level of risks are as follows. First, there is a low frequency of the crisis occurrence. Uh, the value of the asset being protected is not that high. And the cost of reducing the risk is high. Uh, the impact to operations and life safety is minimal. And that concludes the Chapter 4 lecture. Make sure you log into Blackboard and check this uh, chapter's uh, expectations and deliverables. And I will see you all in chapter five.